So the first one is uh, I was at a conference in New York. Um, this was maybe four or five years ago now. Um, and I was going up on st about to go up on stage to give a keynote talk. And this was during a huge dinner with, you know, there's a thousand people in the audience and they're all sitting around tables. And I was walking to the stage to give my talk when um, a guy said, excuse me, ma'am, we're done with our plates. Can you take our plates for me? <laughs> I'm Phoebe Foy with Quantopian. Quantopian educates and inspires people all over the world to solve today's hardest investment challenges. Today on another episode of Women in Fintech, I'm here with Christina Chi, who's a partner at Domeyard. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Phoebe. Why don't we start by you just telling everyone a little bit about Domeyard and a typical day for you. Sure. So um, I founded Domeyard about six years ago now, um, out of a dorm room, actually. So wow. we were still in college at the time. <laughs> uh, and basically, uh, we were trading. You would, we'd go to class by day, because we had to go to class. <laughs> and then we would trade at you know 2 or 3 AM, um, oh the European gosh. session, you know, at 2 or 3 AM in the morning. Um, Oh and that gosh. was when we kind of started it and decided, well, you know what, like, we might as well just start this company. And if, you know, if things fail, it's okay. Um, we have a good safety net. We can always go work elsewhere. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. Yeah. So, so we decided to start it up. Mm -hmm. um, so today now we're, um, you know, one of the, I guess, foremost uh, startup HFT kind of hedge funds, which is kind of a unique thing altogether. Yeah, um, and we're lucky to be live today, <laughs> I guess. So. It's challenging. Yeah, it is. Very cool. So, um, yeah, what's a typical day like for you as a partner? Oh man, there's there's no typical oh, day yeah. now. I it's assume. so <laughs> yeah, like uh, I've been focusing on you know I do a lot of investor relations. I mm -hmm. do um, a little bit of a little bit of coding here and there as well. Um, managing the team, hiring people, yeah, you know, kind of a little bit of everything. Exactly. Um, you know, with our service providers and stuff like that too. So just working with kind of everybody to make sure that the company comes together at the wow. end of the day and yeah. is, is still alive and trading mm -hmm. and you know managing things properly. <laughs> and what year was it in college that you started? Um, this was back in 2012, uh, and then I graduated in 2013. Okay. So yeah. And so what made you decide it'd be better? to start this on your own than just go look for a job somewhere? That's a good question. Wow. <laughs> um, you know, I had a couple of internship experiences uh, and, and they were great. Definitely mm -hmm. really fun experiences. But I realized that for me, Wall Street wasn't maybe the right environment just Got for it. me personally. Yep. Um, you know, I preferred a smaller environment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, you know, in finance, obviously, there's, there's a lot of big firms. And back then, I didn't know there were a lot of small firms as well. Yeah. And so, um, but anyway, we started a small company and um, that way, you know, we could kind of control the culture and create kind of the environment that we wanted to see. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was kind of what kind of drove us to start this business. And the other thing was also realizing that the returns we had were pretty nice, yeah. you know, and that <laughs> we you could, go. that a small firm, we can compete against a large firm mm -hmm. in finance and still do a decent job because finance isn't a winner take all yep. industry. You know, it can, everyone can kind of coexist with one another, which is also amazing. Amazing. And how many of you started it together? It was three people. So I have two other co-founders. Wow. <laughs> that is, that is so great. And what were you studying at the time in college? Um, so I studied finance okay. um, in college. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. And why, I mean, going back to that time, what originally, say, in high school or your freshman year made mm -hmm. you decide to pursue finance? Oh, my goodness. There, to be honest, like, I was very quiet and introverted in high school, <laughs> um, and I didn't know I wanted to study finance, and I didn't, I never knew I would become an entrepreneur at all. I didn't think I was an entrepreneur. You know, it's like I didn't, mm -hmm. I was like, I don't have the DNA. I always gave myself <laughs> excuses like yeah. that. But then, um, then I ended up choosing finance because, uh, actually, um, I realized I wanted a work environment where I could see feedback from my work on a daily basis, okay. hopefully. So I wanted to, you know, in trading, you can see exactly. how, usually depending on the type of trading you do, mm -hmm. we do high frequency trading. So yeah. <laughs> you can see how good or bad you're doing every day because the feedback and the data is so, it's there, it's so obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really like that fit faster feedback loop on my job um, and that it was based on science, you know, and not based on politics. And yeah. so, you know, it's like you can't uh, argue with numbers, you know, if the numbers show that I'm doing a good job, then I'm doing a good job. <laughs> so that That's was a that's so true. Motivator. So did you decide that already freshman year to pursue finance um, or had you like taken some courses prior? Yeah, I like started off wanting to major in biology, worked in a bio lab um, and the feedback that was when I realized the feedback loop, you know, it's yeah. months doing <laughs> research and trying to apply for grants. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, you know, hopefully to try to get published and that takes, that could take years, you know. Um, and so we were working mm -hmm. with PhDs on this and they were telling me like, yeah, you don't want to, you know, if you care about that feedback loop, you don't want to work in this yeah. field. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Um, so I kind of switched around and tried different classes freshman year uh, and then kind of just settled on finance at the end. Okay. Uh, and, you know, I felt it was actually 
thankfully the best decision I've made. And, Absolutely. You know, I thought it was kind of just accidentally fell into it, but at the same time, you know, it turned out pretty decent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, your story is just like so amazing and inspiring. So can you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. actually like starting Dome Yard and like where it went from being yeah. in a dorm to now being successful? Yeah, I think one of the biggest, um, misconceptions people have when they think about starting a hedge fund is like, oh, all you need to do is buy a computer and, you know, create an algorithm and then just tomorrow just launch and magically make billions of dollars, you know? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, right. It sounds so easy, but um, it took us two and a half years to get to launch. Um, okay. And that was, you know, it's a very long time, mm -hmm. um, but pretty average and standard for the industry, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, you know, finding service providers and incorporating, the cost is a lot higher than people would expect. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, all of those things combined, I think, uh, uh, you know, it was pretty challenging, I guess. You have to bypass those initial hurdles of you need to have the money to yeah. pay for your lawyers even, or setting up the bone, bare bone, you know, Very structure true. of the fund. Mm -hmm. um, and most hedge funds have, you know, maybe five or six different uh, legal entities just alone. And then besides that, you need to have all the documents kind of connecting them, mm -hmm. you know, your PPMs and your limited partnership agreements and all those other agreements. It, yeah. it adds up to a lot. <laughs> um, and so doing all of that and setting it up and then finding investors and, you know, we haven't even thought about that yet, you know, yeah. and then finally after that, finally getting your investors on board, um, getting all the technology in place and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so it took us a lot of time and a lot of uh, stress and hardship, I'm I sure. guess, to, to kind of get all that together all at the same time. <laughs> wow. And how, how large is it today? Um, so we trade about, I think, one and a half to two billion ish per day. Now. Amazing. Um, our assets under management for a HFT firm were pretty standard. So we have a very small AUM, we're mm -hmm. less than 100 million. Okay. Um, and what we do is we turn over so many times during the day. So we trade a lot. Uh -huh. and we might mm -hmm. make uh, maybe like up to thousands of trades, you know, during the day. And wow. So that volume kind of adds up. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah. And how about company size? How large is it grown? We're very small. Okay. So I think we're at about 13 full time employees okay. today. So yeah. We're so very different from three. Yeah. <laughs> Some <true>. big growth. <laughs> and so taking a step back before your career, mm -hmm. um, who was there as like a mentor and inspired you to become an entrepreneur or just pursue finance and yeah, all aspects of your life? Mm -hmm. um, you know, funny thing is I've actually never had a formal mentor before. Uh, I think a lot of times uh, people will ask me, actually I get that question a lot at conferences where people will ask me like, who who are your mentors? Who did you look up to? Mm -hmm. And how do you find a mentor actually? Yeah. And you know, my answer always is actually, I don't know, <laughs> because um, I've tried for many years to find a mentor um, and, you know, I actually never found one. Mm -hmm. um, but I have had people, you know, obviously there's people who support me. Um, I have yeah. maybe informal mentors or people who, you know, if I have issues with, I Absolutely. can always go and cry. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, so there's always people like that. Um, but I think also it is important to notice that, um, you know, it's a common topic discussed amongst women, but not amongst men. And I think that's also an interesting. That's true. There should be more studies on that because, you um, you know, men are just encouraged to just do your own thing, you know, just go for it, right? Yeah, Whereas women are like, you need somebody to look up to all the time. Very and, true. And so I think it's a, that's one thing I realized is like, you know, it's okay to not, you know, it's good to have a mentor, but if you don't have one, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, you can still Absolutely. do it. <laughs> um, and that's something that took me a while to kind of come to that realization that it's okay that I never had a formal mentor, yeah. you know, throughout this process. And, and that's all right. Maybe I had 10 different people who were mentors at certain points in time. In some way. Um, in mm -hmm. some way, yeah, but um, nobody who was like formally meeting with me every month or so, you know. Absolutely. I mean, you yeah. just said, like you said, we only ask that question to women, not men. <laughs> another question we only ask to women is, have you experienced, I mean, you're yeah. working in a male-dominated field, have you experienced any, you know, sexism at all? Yeah, it's really interesting today because, um, you know, the reason why I've been to a lot of conferences where we'll have mm -hmm. dinners with all the speakers and a lot of the male speakers will be like, well, there is no such thing as sexism or racism today. You know, and that's because they don't realize it. Um, uh -huh. These days, a lot of the isms of sexism, et cetera, yeah. they're a lot more, um, it's a lot more subtle and subconscious. Like they're, that's they true. don't mean to consciously discriminate and they don't have a bad mm -hmm. intention, but rather mm -hmm. they just kind of do it without even realizing that they were doing something bad. So I'll tell, I have two stories. I'll tell you one story where I was discriminated against and then okay. one story where I discriminated against a woman. Okay. So that can give you guys a sense that even women do. Yeah, you know, it's very subconscious. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so the first one is uh, I was at a conference in New York. Um, this was maybe four or five years ago now. Um, and I was going up on about to go up on stage to give a keynote talk. And this was during a huge dinner with, you know, there's a thousand people in the audience and they're all sitting around tables. And I was walking to the stage to give my talk when um, a guy said, excuse me, ma'am, we're done with our plates. Can you take our plates for me? <laughs> 
And I mean, I was the only Asian woman in the room, yeah. right? And also, like, unfortunately, I was wearing black that day. Oh, no. Um, and so now, like, you know, I never wear black. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there's certain roles I, I oh, do now. Oh, my gosh. But it was very, like, wow, you know, and... Just um, instantly assume. Instantly, mm-hmm. wow, he just assumed that. You know, I said, sorry, I'll, like, I'll pick up your plates as soon as I give my keynote on stage. And he was, like... And the whole table started making fun oh of him. My gosh. And he was like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And afterwards he came up to me and you know, yeah. gave me his card and was like, yeah. Please, I'll treat you to dinner, you know, next time. So he was very nice about it. He didn't have bad intentions. It's exactly. just the subconscious bias that affects you. So true. And you know, obviously I could take that anyway, I could be upset about mm-hmm. it, but at the same time, you know, you can teach them a lesson and be good about it and you know, he's improved as a person. He yeah. hopefully has never done that ever again. Yeah. And so that's, <laughs> that's a positive thing, I guess, that we learned from Very it. Very true. Um, and then the other story I had was when I discriminated, um, was when, uh, you know, we have many investors come into our office and sit down at our table in the conference room. Um, and so sometimes, you know, I, uh, well, most of the time, like maybe 500 people come in so far. And like out of those 500 people, we've had maybe a few women come yeah. in. Um, and so there was one time when a woman came in and she brought two of her colleagues with her. Um, and this was a very big company that everybody knows about. So I, I can't say the name, unfortunately. Okay, no but problem. Um, she came in and, you know, sat down. And um, I actually assumed that the male uh, colleague was her superior. Um, but it turns out mm-hmm. she was the CEO of this, oh. like, really, really big hedge fund. <laughs> and I just Oops. totally made that, yeah, I totally made the wrong assumption. Mm-hmm. Um, and afterwards, I just felt so terrible because I realized, oh, crap, you know, yeah. she's the CEO. But I had seen so many guys come into the office that the automatic assumption is, oh, the woman must be, mm-hmm. you know, the subordinate. And in that case, it wasn't true at yeah. all. So, um, so it just goes to show that, you know, even women make we make these honest mistakes where we discriminate based on things Mm -hmm. that we just see but naturally yeah Um, but it's important to just be aware of those things so now i'll never make that assumption ever again (laughs) no a lot of women that we've talked to like they said a lot of it is so subconscious which is still bad and i'm trying to fix it but a lot of it is subconscious Subconscious. so and you were talking about giving a keynote i know you speak at a lot of conferences how did Mm -hmm. that get started and how have you become so, I'm so great at it. Oh, I mean, you've given keynotes and yeah. talk talks at a lot of places. You know, it kind of started by accident. Actually, <laughs> starting from middle school, my friend, my best friend is a huge um, debater. She, like, oh, okay. loves speaking and debating. Uh-huh. And so uh, she needed a partner for her debate team. And so I just joined her debate team. And back then, I was still very shy and quiet. And yeah. I didn't know how to argue or talk. <laughs> uh, but I guess that really made me good at, um, in terms of knowing how to disagree with somebody professionally, you know, um, how to just have your voice be heard and things uh-huh. like that. So now... You know, I'm not afraid to disagree with panelists <laughs> and, you know, to say stuff professionally, of course, yeah. um, and not try to start a fight, but rather just uh, say respectfully, here's my viewpoint. I like mm-hmm. what you're saying, but here's also this uh, viewpoint as well. And so, you know, just being able to do that has been super, super helpful. Um, but yeah, besides that, like, um, you know, sometimes like a conference organizer, they'll ask me, mm-hmm. um, can you speak at this event? Like if it's like big data or machine learning or something. Yeah. And uh, I would respond back to them being like, I'm not qualified, <laughs> you know, like I'm not a machine learning expert. I didn't mm-hmm. have a PhD in, you know, data science or anything yeah. like that. Um, but then I look at their website and I'll see that there's a, you know, there's a male speaker who um, is around my age, started a hedge fund uh, later than me. And, you know, and he's on like three different panels that day. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And I know what he talks about and I always disagree with him. And so I was like, <laughs> okay, I, I better show up because if I don't show up and set the record straight, uh-huh. then no one will. <laughs> yeah. And so realizing that, I think that was one of my turning points when I realized, okay, I really do have something to say and it is important that I'm there to at least like offer this viewpoint or Definitely. else no one's going to say it. <laughs> Absolutely. Does it take a lot of additional work to mm-hmm. prepare for these conferences aside from your regular yeah. work? Um, so the conference itself obviously takes time away from my work, which is hard because yeah. I have to go back to my office and catch mm-hmm. up over the weekend or whatever else. Mm-hmm. Um, but besides that, as you go and do this over the years, like um, the amount of preparation work actually decreases like okay. at Good. a certain point, especially for panels where you don't need a, any slides mm-hmm. or anything. Like, you just kind of know what to say, and Definitely. it just comes super naturally after some time. It's kind of like being a professor, you know, like, <laughs> a lot of professors where they just, they never say, um, or, like, you know, stutter around or anything. Exactly. It's just because they just know how to do it over the years. So, if we were to ask you, like, a, a young woman hoping to mm-hmm. pursue a career similar to you, whether it's, you know, start their own hedge fund or just... Yeah. you know, pursue a finance route. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say just, um, you know, the uh, 
financial world is kind of, you know, it's what you make of it, right? Mm -hmm. And you put into it as much as you get out of it. Um, I think it's a very interesting area to have a career in actually, because um, it's every company has a financial division, mm -hmm. right? And so Absolutely. we are taught through, you know, we watch Hollywood movies and, you know, Netflix movies and whatever, and we see that Hollywood's this evil place to work <laughs> for. And that, you know, we've watched, I don't know, like, what, what movies are there? Wolf of Wall Street yeah. <laughs> and, you know, those types of movies and they show like this boys club and it's just crazy and stuff. And, uh, but in reality, you know, every company has a financial division, mm -hmm. even a nonprofit does, right? Mm -hmm. And so even if you want to work in the nonprofit space or you want to work in biotech or fintech or any other kind of space, even in regular tech, you know, um, they need finance people there too. Yeah. Uh, and so it's a really applicable area to Absolutely. study for sure. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And how about for yourself? Where do you see your career and Domeyard in, say, the next five to ten years? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I want to continue. I think Domeyard's been it's my baby. Um, yeah. My first baby. You know, of maybe course. I'll have another baby. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, I've grown so emotionally attached to the company. And it is hard. I've been trying to emotionally detach myself a little bit more Understood. just because um, it's easy to get wrapped up in even the small little things that go wrong, you know. Yeah. And um, what do you call it? Like... Um, I used to be wrapped around trying to win every single battle when you should be focused on winning the war, you know, and you can lose some battles and that's okay and Absolutely. let things go. And so I'm um, just learning to, to let that go a little bit and learning to let go of the small things um, has been uh, big for me. And then besides that, like, I think um, maybe, you know, we can always consider growing Dome Yard and the focus of the front fund as well, because um, we've been doing high frequency for six years. Um, okay. That's a long time. Yeah. So maybe, uh, you know, the reason why we started as a hedge fund is like, okay, we want to be able to expand into other asset classes or Very other areas. Cool. And I think that'd be really awesome to, to try out. Yeah. That's so exciting. <laughs> well, we wish you all the luck. Thank you so much for being with us Thank today. Thank you for having me. Of course. It was really great to learn all about your story. Thank you. <laughs>